Welcome everyone to today's session of the, our survivorship series, Aging with Resilience, Maintaining Health as an Older Adult with Cancer, led by Dr. Tam Tammy Shea. This program is hosted by the Blum Resource Center. Over at the Blum, we are grateful to the survivorship team for this continued partnership. The recording of this session will, will be posted on our Blum YouTube playlist and our Blum Digital Resource Center, as well as the survivorship website. For those of you watching live, if you have any questions related to, to, to today's program, please feel free to utilize the chat feature throughout the session. At the end of the session, your questions in the chat will be used to moderate a Q&A. If you have any other questions or would like more information about resources and programs offered through the Blum, please visit our website at www.data-harvard.org slash resource center, or you can email us at blum underscore center at dfci.harvard.edu. Thank you all for joining us. I will now pass the workshop over to Tammy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about the topic that has been near and dear to my heart ever since I started medical school, and it's about geriatrics and older adults, um, and in particular, older adults with cancer, and how to help you all age with resilience. So the objectives for today, um, first of all, what is considered normal and healthy aging? I think that has kind of changed throughout the years in terms of what people think of as normal and healthy aging for themselves, as well as for their loved ones. And how does cancer treatment and survival play a role in this, in this um, idea of older adults and their healthy aging? Some of the topics that we will cover today include medications, function and independence, and cognition. These are some of the things that I had thought about as being particularly important to my patients as they get older, as well as our patients at the Dana-Farber as they face cancer diagnoses and treatment and are also facing aging as well. So often I get this question, um, not so much from my patients, but from researchers, scientists, colleagues, and that is, why do we care? Why do we care about geriatrics and why do we care about older adults? And I think this picture is a very good description of older adults um, as they come into the healthcare system. And that is the silver tsunami. There is a great wave of older adults coming into medicine, coming to the Dana-Farber, looking for treatments, um, diagnoses, but also looking for ways to better manage their own health so that they can age well and that they can be preventive and proactive about their care. I've been told by some people that this picture of the silver tsunami is negative and that it's a negative way of thinking about older adults and it may suggest some ageism, but I actually think that's the contrary. I think the silver tsunami shows just how powerful this new generation of older adults are in terms of being proactive and vocal about their health and wanting to learn and find ways to advocate for themselves so that they can healthily age. And also when they're taking care of their loved ones, um, their parents or their children and grandchildren, finding ways to um, be vocal about what their needs are. And so I think it's actually a positive way of thinking about our senior citizens as they get older and as they advocate and ask for ways to, to maintain their health and to age gracefully and with resilience. So I do think that cancer care for older adults is an issue of health equity. Um, older adults present unique challenges in cancer treatment, and it gives us a lot of opportunities to improve the experience and care of our older adults as they seek health care. As you see in this graph, there are more and more people in the senior citizen category starting from about 2015. And this number of uh, senior citizens looking for um, geriatric care and mindful aging is just going to continue to grow in the next couple of decades. And if we don't think about age when it comes to cancer care and cancer treatment and management, we know that there's going to be poor outcomes, and that's kind of not acceptable to me. Older adults represent most patients diagnosed with cancer, 
and they are still the most underrepresented in clinical trials. And yet more than half of all cancer survivors are over the age of 65. So I often ask my colleagues in medicine to think about um, older adults with cancer in terms of frailty or resilience. Um, because I feel that frailty or resilience better captures physiological age and predicts outcomes better for my patients than chronological age. Often as you get older, age becomes more and more a number. You can have someone who is extremely robust and resilient and will do very well with cancer treatment when they're 80 years old compared to another person who may not do so well because they have a lot of other medical illnesses and concerns who's also 80 years old. So I encourage people to think about resilience or frailty instead about just the number when it comes to age and to older adults with cancer. The good news is that resilience is a dynamic process. Um, I often talk to people about resilience as a bank. So throughout your life, you put into this bank or this reserve, cognitive and functional reserve. So when you exercise and eat well and you take care of yourself, you're putting into this bank some additional functional reserve. When you go to lectures and you listen to music and you try to do things that stimulate your cognition and your mind, or take care of your mind by making sure that your mood is as optimized as possible, you're putting into this bank some cognitive reserve so that when you are older and something happens in terms of illnesses that do tend to crop up as you get older, you have some reserve that we can tap into as clinicians. So it brings up this question of how hard to push. If you have a patient that has taken care of themselves and tried to put into this bank or this reserve as much function and cognition as possible, then we may be able to push a little bit harder. And that is why resilience is a dynamic process. People can go from robust to pre-frail to frail and severely frail, but it is not a one-way street or a one-directional cycle. It goes in multiple directions. And so luckily, if you have some reserve, there is the chance that if you go from robust to frail or severely frail because of some illness such as cancer, if you have some reserve, we can try to treat you and get you back to a better state condition to a better state, such as pre-frail or robust. So this is what I do at the Dana-Farber as the geriatrician. I look at patients and I do a comprehensive geriatric assessment, kind of like the cardiologists who look at an EKG or maybe a neurologist who looks at a CAT scan or an MRI of the brain, the comprehensive geriatric assessment is what geriatricians use as their tool to better understand and identify which of their patients they are looking at are vulnerable, help the oncologist at the Dana-Farber at least, select the most appropriate care or the most appropriate treatment plan, get a better sense of patients' cognitive and functional reserve, get a sense of their social vulnerabilities in terms of how well supported they are at home or not, or in the community. And then also to talk about goals of care and what matters most to our patients. Um, that's kind of key actually. And the bottom line is to give us a sense of how hard we can push as the clinicians. So the plan is really key. I ask a lot of questions in my geriatric assessment because we're trying to develop the plan that will work best for our patients. And this is what geriatricians and age-friendly clinicians do best. Developing a plan based on the comprehensive geriatric assessment allows us to determine interventions that are best for our patients, helps connect our patients with resources and supports, and also helps us develop a longitudinal relationship because this is a dynamic process. As they go along in their treatment care um, at the Dana-Farber or even after they're done with treatment, we develop a longitudinal relationship. 
So I wanted to just describe briefly um, how in the real world at the Dana-Farber has the comprehensive geriatric assessment been used. So in 2016, we um, established the Older Adult Hematologic Malignancy Program, and it was a specialized research and now a clinical service for the blood cancer patients at the Dana-Farber over the age of 70. We now have about 1,100 patients that have been assessed and have gone through this program. And we found that having this program available to our patients really increased the goals of care discussions and improved our ability to figure out what matters most to our patients who are older and who are facing a blood cancer diagnosis. And this program has become valued by clinicians and patients alike because of our increased attention to age-related vulnerabilities. Interestingly, we did study and publish on this because having a geriatrician involved in your care when you're older and you have a blood cancer didn't improve one year survival and didn't decrease um, acute care utilization, but it did improve quality of life. So I like to say that as a geriatrician, I'm not necessarily increase the number of years to a patient, I'm improving the quality of the life for these patients. This is one question that I get a lot and I think is becoming increasingly uh, relevant to our patients at the Dana-Farber, and that is about cognition. We did a study a couple years ago specifically looking at the older adults with blood cancers at the Dana-Farber and found that on screening, approximately 17 to 35% of these adults had probable cognitive impairment. And these patients didn't do as well. So patients with probable cognitive impairment had a higher rate of mortality, even when we consider how aggressive their cancers were and how sick they were with other medical illnesses. And this is pretty important because for me, that does not mean, and for the oncologist too, that we would withhold cancer care to a patient because they might have some memory problems. It means that we need to engage them in other ways, maybe a little bit differently, to make sure that they are successful when it comes to their cancer treatment. So I'm often asking myself, um, and the clinicians are asking me, is this chemo brain or is this dementia or is this depression? And what do we do about it? So I help try to tease out exactly which is going on in terms of memory concerns for our patients, whether they're undergoing cancer treatment, whether they have completed cancer treatment, or even when they're many years out from transplant or cancer treatment, which exactly is going on that is affecting their memory? And what can we do to help them? So some very practical things include writing things down, writing clear instructions for our patients, or calling and following up a couple days later. Coming to the Dana-Farber can be pretty overwhelming sometimes. I understand. It's it's where I work and where I've been for many years, but for patients, it can be daunting. And so if you already have a little bit of memory issues, how can we best help you to make sure you get the most out of your visits? And then I talk to patients a lot about lifestyle changes, little things like exercise, even if it's just a few minutes, three times a week, optimizing your mood and making sure that your mood is as good as it can be making sure that your sensory deficits like hearing or vision are optimized as much as possible. And also diet, how is your nutrition? We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then if people do have memory concerns, you know, this year is particularly exciting for dementia, I believe, because there are potentially new treatment options coming out. But as of now, we have some memory medications that are available, but they have their own side effects and they are only so effective. They can stabilize people's memory, but they don't really stop the decline or help people regain their memory capabilities. And so for a lot of patients, I counsel and support them through the idea of cognitive rehabilitation, or there's apps and websites that allow you to try to exercise your brain to keep your cognition as sharp as possible for as long as possible. 
So I want to touch on mood and sleep a little bit because with cancer treatment, particularly for breast cancer and probably for prostate cancer also, hot flashes are a big concern that affects people's um, ability to sleep well at night. The diagnosis of cancer often will affect people's moods. You will be kind of not human, I think, if you don't respond or react to a cancer diagnosis. As you get older, you have to run to the bathroom more often at night. And then the quality of sleep and the depth of sleep just naturally changes as you get older. So there is a lot of options and a lot of resources that we can connect people to at the Dana-Farber, including in survivorship opportunities to talk about sleep hygiene with some of our psychologists and psychiatrists. There's even cognitive behavioral therapy options at the Dana-Farber to help improve mood and sleep. And then there's also medications. Not every medication is the same. Some are quite good and safe for older people and others, often the ones that are over the counter can actually have um, downstream problems with them in terms of side effects and their effects on people's risk of falling and memory. And so having an open conversation about what medications may help our older patients get a better night's sleep is important. I want to touch on nutrition as well, just a little bit. A lot of our treatments at the Dana-Farber are going to cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So it's important to get a good handle on nutrition before you start treatment. And then afterwards too, once you've completed treatment or you're on maintenance treatment, what can we do to help you improve your nutritional intake? There is a classic term called tea and toast diet, where um, often older adults, because of some limitations perhaps in mobility, getting to the grocery store, being able to cook for just one person, um, results in a tea and toast diet. And that causes problems because there's going to be nutritional deficits, electrolyte imbalances. Um, people tend to feel dizzy and weak on that kind of diet. And so there's a lot of things to consider when we talk about and try to support our older adults in terms of improving their nutrition while they're getting cancer treatment or even afterwards as well as they're recovering from cancer treatment. I have had plenty of patients tell me it is difficult with inflation to be able to afford protein anymore, or it is difficult to get to the grocery store. Um, a rotisserie chicken can last them the entire week. So why not? Um, or, you know, they just don't really want to cook for one person anymore because the incentive of, do, of, of doing that is not the same as being able to cook for your partner, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren. There's a lot of things to unpackage and to think about when we talk about nutrition for older adults. My bottom line is usually to try to push protein, to try to get to 40 grams daily. Protein basically turns into muscle and weight. It's the most efficient conversion um, of what you take in and what it becomes for your body. Protein also settles the stomach and there's a lot of uh, vegetarian as well as meat options for protein, such as tofu, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, then there's seafood and red meats. So really think about the proteins you're taking in every day. You really, um, if you had to only just eat one thing or a couple things a day, what should it be? It should be protein. And then I just last week, actually, I was talking to some patients about nutrition and I gave them the okay or the green light to eat as much ice cream and cake cake as they wanted and they were delighted. Um, these were like 90 plus year old patients. And I said, really, by this age, you get to eat whatever you want. And that includes extra ice cream after dinner. And so I often tell my patients, you know, we need a little extra padding for you because as you go through chem uh, chemotherapy or um, as you're just getting older and you have a risk for falling or getting sick, let's say with a pneumonia or COVID, we need a little extra reserve, a little extra padding to help you get through the tough times. 
And that kind of leads into my next topic, which is about falls. Um, as you get older, naturally, there's going to be sarcopenia or muscle wasting and weakness. A lot of patients who start chemotherapy end up with lower blood pressures, and often they continue taking their antihypertensives for blood pressure because that's what they were told to do, or they continue taking their diabetes medications despite the fact that they've lost weight and their blood sugars are lower. So I really try to be aware of people's risk for falling because often as you get older, your blood pressures go down, your blood sugars go down, you develop sarcopenia, and there is a chance for falling. Um, with a lot of our cancer treatments as well, especially in leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, um, in all the GI cancers and breast cancer, there is a risk for neuropathy. So numbness and tingling, burning pain in the extremities, like the legs, the feet, even the hands. So people are already at risk for falling because of aging. Add on top of that, all the cancer treatments we throw at you, um, you are at a higher risk for falls. Definitely, we want to try to keep people out of the hospital and as healthy as possible um, without any fractures as possible. So we really want to be aware of risk of falling. And there's a lot of things that we can do. Just being aware about falls and the fact that there are no accidental falls, falls happen for a reason, is already progress in itself. But there's interventions such as physical therapy, either outpatient or at home, home safety evaluations to see if that rug at home in the living room may not be such a good idea anymore. Are those slippers actually a little bit too slippery? Um, our occupational therapy colleagues are excellent at doing home safety evaluations. And then also assist devices. Would it be helpful to have a walker? Actually, maybe a walker is not so good if you have some Parkinson's and you're a bit slow to get started. Maybe a cane or a tripod cane is actually the better way to go. And then we really take a look in geriatrics at medications because medications, every medication has side effects. And so we really want to dig deep into the medication lists for all of our patients to think about is um, the risk for falling due to a medication that we prescribed. So then that's a little segue to polypharmacy and medications. Um, like I just said, every medication has a risk of side effects and also a risk of interactions with the treatments that you get at the Dana-Farber. In particular, there's often an increase of bleeding risk with medications. I do wanna to try to establish an open relationship with all my patients and it needs to be a collaborative relationship. And so it's important to talk to your doctors and your um, clinical providers in terms of um, what supplements you might be taking. I have here a website, the Memorial Sloan Kettering website, because it's an excellent website developed by Memorial Sloan Kettering for their cancer patients that has lists of all the different kinds of herbs and over-the-counter medications that are available to patients and their families, because there's often a lot of questions about whether it's okay to be still taking you know, glutathione or melatonin or um, vitamin E. And that website has a lot of good information about why some people take these herbs or um, supplements and what are some potential interactions to look out for. So I encourage people to have a very open relationship and communicate with their uh, clinicians about what they might be thinking about taking as supplements, what they are taking as supplements, because you'd be surprised by how open we are about that, but also about how important it is to talk about these medications with your um, clinicians. We just published a study recently that looked at number of medications and risk for frailty. Um, and I think it's kind of important to see that when you are a patient and you're taking more than eight medications, your risk for frailty increases quite dramatically up to 2.82, which means about a 282% increased risk for frailty if you are taking 
more than eight medications. What you see here is a little bit more complicated. I had wanted to look at medications that may be considered not so good for older adults because they're anticholinergic. And it's a term that describes medications that may have more of an effect on people's brains, especially as they're older than we would like. And it did show that if patients were on medications like Benadryl or um, benzodiazepines, um, like Ativan and Valium, these medications, there may be a reason to be taking them, but you have to be aware of how many of these you're taking because they do add up and they can affect your risk for frailty. So future directions, you know, at the Dana-Farber, I get referrals from everywhere, from all directions, from the social workers, from the infusion nurses, from the nurse practitioners and PAs and the oncologists, even referrals from patients and families. We're hoping to continue to expand and collaborate with all cancer groups at the Dana-Farber, not just blood cancers and their precursors, but also GI, breast, um, lung cancer, prostate, and GU. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this year. I think it's an exciting year in uh, geriatric oncology in more and more referrals from all different groups um, and opportunities to learn more about the different kinds of cancers and the different kinds of patients. So my take home points for today are that healthy and resilient aging as an older adult with cancer is definitely possible. And I think it's becoming even more and more possible as the baby boomers get older and are very proactive about what they can do for their health. Geriatric co-management has been shown to improve quality of life and quality of care, not yet necessarily quantity of life or quantity of care, but I think the priority and what matters most to me as well as my patients is about quality of life and quality of care. Geriatrics is a very multidisciplinary collaborative approach to care, and it's about the opportunity of taking the journey together with my patients. So that's it. Um, here are some websites for our different um, geriatric oncology groups at the Dana-Farber. And again, as I mentioned, um, we're hoping to continue to expand, and I'm open to any questions at this point. Great. Thank you so much, Tammy. This was a really great presentation. Um, I will work on adding that Memorial Sloan Kettering website to our Digital Resource Center, um, so be sure to look out for that. It looks like we do not have any questions at the moment. Again, you can, you can feel free to email um, the Blum Center if you have anything, and I can always pass it to Tammy as well. So thank you all for joining today, and thank you especially, Tammy.